that right? Can everybody hear me? No. Yes. Yes. No. Okay. Cool. Um, I'm Georgia. I'm Jenner. Cool. We're gonna talk about math and mathematics. As soon as I figure out how this works. There we go. Um, so we're going to be going over some issues with math education, a few of my favorite fields of mathematics, and then how to sort of move forward with the tools that we've gained. Uh, but before we get started, about how much math background does everybody have? Like, who took math in high school? Trans. Okay, who continued taking it in college or, all right, who has taken some calculus? Who knows how to write a proof? All right, cool. Uh, who has a degree in mathematics? All right, nifty. Um. <laughs> who, uh, who doesn't know how to write a proof? And additionally, who, uh, who hears the word proof too, right? and just gets <laughs> nervous? <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Um, so we're mostly going to focus on some of my issues with high school mathematics. Um, so how many of you sort of hated math in high school? All right, cool. Of curiosity, why? I was on drugs most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> that would make it a lot harder. <laughs> yeah. My high school decided to try something called integrated math, where they taught every single area of math all at once, one week at a time. <gasps> I did that. Oh my god, I did that. I remember that. All right. Um, anybody else? Two interpretation. Yes. All right. Um, so yeah, a lot of people sort of hate math early on in their education because it's very tedious and there's a lot of failure and it doesn't really seem like you're studying something that makes sense or has to do with anything at all. Um, and if there's anything that's going to kill your enthusiasm for something, it's going to be failing at it and not understanding what it's for. Which is sort of about, it's similar to the way they teach grammar in English classes. You sort of go through all these rules that like they're there and I guess maybe they're useful for something, but it really seems like they're just doing it to mess with you. Like they're just doing it so they have something to test you on. And it is important to understand grammar and it is important to be able to solve equations, but that's not really the point, even though they spend a lot of time on exactly that. Um, so this is a quote by a man named John Green that I think sums up a lot of people's feelings towards mathematics early on. <laughs> and if this was your initial reaction, if you were really bad at something and, and you felt like it, it wasn't useful at all, you'd probably just go do something else, something that was at least interesting or you were at least good at. Um, but that's not really what mathematics is. It shouldn't be the tedious set of rules that you just have to follow to find a number. It shouldn't be just hitting a nail with a hammer over and over and over again. And if you miss, you get docked points. That's not what it's supposed to be. Um, so I'm going to show you the kind of stuff that I like to do. Uh, so these are called graphs. They have nothing to do with x, y graphs. It just means graphical information. I don't remember what it means. That's not the important part. Um, so we're going to pretend that each of these is a little island and each of these lines in between is a bridge and we're vacationing on this little archipelago and you want to cross all the bridges in one day and then get back to your hotel at the end. So on one of these it's possible and on the other archipelago it's not. Any ideas which one? Say that again. Okay, so you want to be able to cross every single one of these lines exactly once and then get back to the dot that you started on. One of them works and the other one doesn't. So who, who says the one on the left is doable? And who's holding out for the one on the right? All right, so the one on the left is the one that works. Um, so this project, or this problem that we're working on right now is called Eulerian circuits. And it's really just puzzles. It's like Sudokus. You're just looking for the answer to the puzzle. Um, this was one of the first problems that ever showed up in graph theory. And how many of you have heard of the Konigsberg bridge problem? This one over here is actually Konigsberg. <laughs> um, so what happened is there was a town that had bridges and they wanted to cross all of them. And a few mathematicians were bored and said, okay, well, let's see if we can figure out if it works. And it turned out it didn't. And then they're like, okay, well, why doesn't it work? Um, and Euler came up with a solution for when it works and when it doesn't. And I'm going to tell you how he figured it out. So we know that if we're gonna go through every single edge, then we're going to have to 
if we're going to go through every single edge and get back to our start point, that means every time we enter one of these, we need to be able to leave it, which means for every time, which means that there has to be an entrance and an exit point or an even number of edges sticking out of every single dot. Does that make sense? Yeah. In Oh, right, sorry. If I get like too deep into the terminology, tell me. I don't hear it is part of the problem. Um, these are called edges. I'll try to say lines. I might call these vertices or nodes, but they're dots, islands. Uh, yeah, let me know if I, do, if I use too much terminology. I seriously can't hear it. Um, so does that make sense that there would have to be two edges for every time you enter the nodes? One to enter on. Yeah, one to enter, one to leave. Um, so how come the one on the right doesn't work? Yeah, there's one that has only three. So you would either not be able, you would either not be able to get out of it or you wouldn't be able to get to it in the first place. All right, so here's a slightly harder one. Um, it would really suck to have to test these and like actually just test every single path and try to get through it and look for a route through all of them. But given what we know about the number of edges or the number of lines sticking out of a dot, which one works and which one doesn't? We know the one on the right doesn't. We don't necessarily know the one on the left works. We know that it meets a condition. It is actually, it, that's the only, con well, it is a necessary and sufficient condition, which probably doesn't help most people. But that's the only criteria. Okay. So, well, also it has to be one piece. Obviously, if you like can't get to another spot, then obviously you won't be able to <laughs> reach everything. Um, so yeah, as the problems get bigger, you need to be able to figure out a solution for how to find answers, not just be able to find answers. So it's the difference between being able to solve a Sudoku and knowing how to solve all of the Sudokus ever. <laughs> um, so like I said before, this is called graph theory. This is one of my absolute favorite fields in mathematics. Um, I mostly like discrete stuff, but um, it's a very abstracted way to think about a lot of problems. And consequently, it tends to have a lot of applications. So you can use it to solve maps, like Google Maps does. You can do it to track the spread of diseases or analyze airline routes, or even use it to make trees in linguistics. And it's become really, really useful in social networking. Uh, the cool thing about the difference between Facebook and Twitter is one of them has directed edges. Like, they care who's following who, but in Facebook, they don't actually care. They just treat it as if you're following each other, which is like two huge branches in graph theory between like whether things have a direction or not. I think that part's really cool. And then that there at the bottom is Konigsberg. So that's the problem that we were solving at the beginning. All right. So we've got this idea that we need to be able to find a way to solve all the puzzles, not just one of them. We need to be able to build tools. Um, so in math education, and actually probably all of your education, you really shouldn't be focusing on like collecting wood or facts. You should be focusing on building tools that you can analyze the wood with or work with the wood with. <laughs> but something that helps you work with the facts that you're given. So it doesn't really help to memorize equations if you don't really know what they mean. They're supposed to be a tool, like a hammer, and you shouldn't be practicing to just hit a nail. You should be learning why a hammer is the right tool for the job and how you make a hammer, or at least what are the necessary criteria. Because technically a rock could get it done most of the time, but that's not really ideal. So the point of mathematics versus math is that you should be thinking about how to build tools, not just are you good at you know, hitting the nail most of the time. Um, oh, yeah, and in this analogy, memorization is having a tool that you never put away. It shouldn't be holding it because someone told you to and then you can set it down when the test is done. It should just be something that is there all the time. If you're memorizing something, it's because you know it's useful, not because someone told you that you have to hold it. Um, so let's try and make a hammer. <laughs> um, so the hammer I'd like to give you right now is called contradiction. And this is a style of proof, which don't worry, if you haven't done proofs before, it should still be OK. Um, but the idea of a proof by contradiction is you're just going to assume something that's not true. 
And then you're just going to follow along that path until you accidentally prove something that is blatantly and stupidly false. And at that point, you know that you went wrong, which means that your original assumptions had to be wrong. So we're going to try and use this new tool. Does that tool sort of make sense? Nod your heads or react in some way. <laughs> Excellent, OK. All right, so how many prime numbers are there? Four. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why not? Um, I would love to see the proof for that. <laughs> Well, it's a, it's a contradiction proof, right? Yes, we are going to do it by contradiction. Um, I think I we could use four. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're right. But instead of proving that there, instead of using contradiction to prove that it's not four and it's not five and there's more than six, there's more than seven and more than eight, we're going to try something a little tidier. Um, <laughs> What's the word most elegant? That's the word they usually use What's when you have a nice. We're getting there. For, OK. <laughs> so there are infinite primes, and I'm going to prove it. But first, we need to talk about what a prime number is. A prime number is anything that is not divisible by anything other than 1 and itself. So it has to have exactly two divisors. And then the other numbers are called composite. Well, there's 1 and 0. And then the, all the other ones are called composite numbers. In general, one and zero, just you just have to like mention that they're not going to play nice and they're not going to follow the rules. But apart from that, just ignore them. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, all the other ones are called composite numbers. And if it's, not, if it's divisible by something more than one and itself, then it must be divisible by a prime number. Does that make sense? All right, cool. The other piece of information we need for this proof is that if you have a number, n, and then you have the number above it, n plus 1, they can't both be divisible by anything. They can't be divisible by any of the same numbers except 1. Do you see why that would be true? So if they were both divisible by 3, you would need to be able to take three steps to get from the first one to the second one. But they're only one apart, so there's just not enough room for all the steps. So that's why you can't have any composite number that is divisible, or actually any number. You can't have any number that is divisible by n and n plus 1. All right, so now comes the big contradiction part. We're just going to assume that there's a finite number of primes. So that means that there has to be a last one. At some point, they just stop, and there's a last one. So if we know that there's a last one, then we know that we can multiply them all together. So if we multiply all the primes together, and we get one really big number, which I'm going to call David. Um, I guess it should have been Goliath. That would have been smarter. Um, anyway, <laughs> we're going to call it Goliath. Um, we have this really big number that's that is all of the prime numbers multiplied together. So I'm going to add 1 to that. And what is this number divisible by? Well, it can't be divisible by any of the primes, because we just said we multiplied them all together, and it's only 1 away. But we also said it can't be a prime, because we already counted all of those. So what we've done is we've accidentally created an integer that's not a prime or a composite number. So this is the blatantly, stupidly false part. <laughs> We've accidentally created an impossible number. So we know that one of our assumptions was wrong. And since our only assumption was that there was a finite number of primes, we know that there has to be an infinite number. Because if they ever stop, then we have an impossible number soon afterwards. OK, does that all make sense? All right, so we made a hammer called contradiction. And then we just used it to prove something about the natural world. Um, I don't know if you consider numbers part of the natural world, but I'm going to say they are. Um, so that's our tool that helps us to work with the wood or the fact that we've found. All right, so another way you know that you've sort of, you've run into some issues in your math education is if this is legitimately what word problems look like to you. So if you really, really hate word problems, like they really seem completely nonsensical, then that means that someone taught you how to hit a nail with a hammer, but they never really told you why you had a hammer in the first place. They just said, here, do this. And they never showed you like, what the context was, or when you would need a hammer, or why a hammer was even the best tool for the job. Um, this is also called symbol manipulation. <laughs> I don't know. When you're just sort of moving things around based on the patterns that your teacher taught you, but you never actually learned why you could do those. You never learned the rules that said why you could do that. 
Um, so I'm gonna try to give you a word problem that hopefully we have the tools to solve. Um, I guess I'll just read that. If you have n people in a room and everyone has a different number of friends, friendship has to be mutual, then how many people must be in the room? So this is an example of some people in a room who know each other. And this is actually one that doesn't work because we have one person right here who has two friends and another person right here who has two friends. So this is an example that doesn't work. But what's, how many people would you need in the room for this to actually work? So you got some number of friends, or some number of people, and they all know a different number of people in the room. So how many of you are like me and have no idea where to start even thinking about it and are just sort of like, what? Okay, all right. I think some That's of you are normal. liars. <laughs> okay, um, how would you try to go about figuring this out since some of you didn't raise your hands? Yeah? Maybe start with Or use like a number instead of n, like think like if there was two people, how many would that be? If there was four, and kind of um, piece it up that way. Okay. So testing different numbers. Yeah. I, I might try to do it inductively. So start off with one person and just keep adding people and graph edges as needed. Cool. I did not think to do this inductively. That was not something I thought to try. Um, well, so we're going to start with the base case of two. And if there are two people, then either they don't know each other, and they both know zero people, or they both know each other, and they both know one people. So we know two doesn't work. We could try three. <laughs> did I not say that there had to be more than one person? I didn't. One does technically work. People. People, <laughs> does, people implies, like he says, people implies more than one person. It's plural. All right. <laughs> okay, so one doesn't count. I'm not the mathematician in this talk. <laughs> I'm the engineer. <laughs> all right. Um, so you could try all the numbers individually. And I promise it's going to take you a really long time before you figure out the answer. So once again, we're going to try something a little bit clever. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that if they all have to have a different number of friends, then I'm just going to name the person after the number of friends they have. So what we have is one person who knows only one other person in the room, and that person's name is one. And there's a person who knows two people in the room, and that person's name is two. Yeah? Uh, so I, I feel like there's a step where can't assume that there will be one person who has each of those numbers of friends. But you're you right. To prove that. You're absolutely right. And I, when I finish this, I can tack on how to deal with that particular problem. Um, but first, we're going to go through the proof, and then I will deal with that outlier case. Um, so this is what we're doing. We have a person named one, and they have one friend. So if we were to go through this whole thing and say one person has one friend, one person has two friends, one person has three friends, and then all the way up to n minus one friends, how many friends does n have? Uh, yes, we can do it that way. It's the exact same proof. It just requires slightly different wording. So we're going to do this one first, and then I'll do the zero case. Um, so we could say n has n friends, but there's only n minus one other people in the room. So there isn't n people for that person to be friends with. Now if we switch it and we start with zero, that's kind of the same as just taking this right here, putting it at the front, and calling it zero. Which seems like it would work, except for then we have a person that knows zero people, and then the last one, n minus one, would have to know everybody else in the room apart from themselves. Does that make sense? So. Yeah, you can start at zero, and it just sort of changes the naming. But it's the same proof. Um, so what we've shown is that the smallest possible ordering of numbers doesn't work, which is why if we were to increase the numbers, it still won't work. Because we'll end up having somebody who has to have more friends in the room than there are people in the room. So this is another contradiction proof. We went, on, we went ahead and just assumed that something was true that wasn't true. And that it was possible to even solve this problem. So
So this is why it would take a really long time if you tried testing all of the numbers, is because there's never going to be a number where it does work. So I don't recommend trying it that way. Um, this particular style of contradiction proof is called the pigeonhole principle, which I just think has a cute name. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is that you have some set of things, pigeons, and you have another set of things, pigeonholes. And if there's more pigeons, you have to put two pigeons in one hole. But it's essentially just another contradiction proof. Does that make sense? OK. So we have this idea now that mathematics isn't supposed to be trying to solve a puzzle for a number or for an equation or solving for zero. We're trying to build up the tools that allow us to figure out how to do that. And it doesn't really matter if you solve the individual puzzles, just that you know how to do it. Um, you need to be able to understand why your tools work, why, like what are the underlying principles that make a hammer work, including things like weight and gravity and the materials and the pieces that go into it, which is the proof methods, like contradiction or per, a pigeonhole principle. It's hard to say, pigeonhole principle. There we go. Um, and the other thing you need to know is when you need a hammer and when you need a screwdriver. So you need to know what type of problem you're trying to solve and really pull that apart before you try to figure out what tools to use. And that's where the word problem issue comes in. The word problem problem issue, dilemma. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, if you don't really understand why someone's giving you a hammer, then you're not going to be able to figure out when somebody gives you a project that the hammer is the right tool for the job. And that's, and so not being able to solve word problems is the symptom of that issue. Oh, I just thought of another metaphor that works. It's not a tool shed, it's a kitchen. And you're trying to use like the sharp edge of the counter instead of a knife. Anyway, there, you've got like all these appliances. Oh, and some of them are really weird. Like somebody just shows you an equation that solves like one thing. That's that weird like sandwich grilling thing that for some reason you have, even though you also have a frying pan and a stove, but you have this thing that perfectly grills sandwiches. I like this metaphor a lot better, actually. Um, <laughs> Um, right, so you want to collect tools, and you don't want to spend forever practicing with one tool. You do need to practice, you need to get good at it, but that's not the point. You need to be able to understand your tools, and you need to be able to collect a lot of them. Not get good at one of them, and then as soon as your tests are over, just leave them to rust, or get rid of them. Um, which is unfortunately how a lot of mathematics, edu mathematics education forces people to learn, is you're not really given projects to work on, you're just given something to do over and over and over again, and you're supposed to demonstrate that you're good at it. But you're not really good at mathematics at that point. You're kind of just good at following instructions and memorization, which isn't helpful. Um, so I would encourage everyone to sort of try to go into, try to study more math with the intent to just understand the structure. Don't focus on what you want to build just yet, but try to just focus on understanding the underlying structure of what's going on. And hopefully it'll be less tedious, it'll feel a little bit more like a science class where you're discovering new phenomenon, but you're still gonna fail a lot. There's a lot of just being wrong. And that's what discovery is. Discovery is just continually finding out you are wrong over and over again. But your motivations are going to change a little bit for why to continue learning math. Um, would you like to talk a little bit yeah. about your so, projects? Uh, this isn't awkward at all. Um, <laughs> so I'm an engineer. I'm an electrical engineer. And I've uh, gotten into a little bit of programming. And um, part of why I ended up doing this talk is because um, George has been converting me to math and to math, <laughs> to math thinking. And um, so I, I did really bad in math in high school. I did really bad in math in college. Um, and I, I think I've actually passed differential equations and linear algebra both, and I'm not sure. For the record, I didn't pass DPQ the first two times. <laughs> <laughs> I think they passed me the last time out of pity. I don't have any idea what was going on in that class. So, yeah. <laughs> I think, I think um, I'm going to talk about two things, and, and one of them is, is um, the really the applications thing. And I keep saying applications to her, and I keep saying, like, I'm an engineer, and yes, you should learn these things for, for applied reasons. So like if you're, um, 
I think I suggested some of the stuff on the, the slide with like Google and Facebook and the mapping. Um, if you get into the math and you, it lets you, um, it lets you optimize your algorithms. It lets you think in a more rigorous way, in a more systematic way about what you're doing. Uh, because I found that the, in the same way that I went into my math class and I just did exactly what they told me and I memorized and I spit out the answers and it all seemed to be fine and then I, I didn't learn anything really out of it. In that same way, I, I was doing that in engineering when I was building things. I was like, oh, I've been taught how to put this circuit together and, I, and then I would run into these things where I, I um, I work for a really great boss, and he, um, he'll have this way of introducing me to what's actually going on in the physics underneath. And, and I, once I understand that, the memorizing isn't, it's not memorizing anymore. It's understanding my concepts. It's applying things better. It's making better, more informed decisions for better products. And it's, um, and this is, this is another uh, sort of fundamental disagreement kind of about how we are. Uh, mathematician and engineer. Um, one of the things I didn't like about math was that I couldn't see a tangible thing at the end. Like if I went to the library and I read a book, and I kept doing this because I was like, oh, I ought to really learn Diffie-Q. I ought to really like get into linear algebra. I ought to really understand this other geometry stuff that I hear about. And I would get a book and I would study for two or three days. It would be interesting. I'd read some blog posts. And then I'd forget about it, and it would just go away, and I wouldn't use it in any way. And, uh, and part of that is because um, the thing I really love about engineering is that I work for a week, and then I can hand you something with blinky lights on it. <laughs> and I can say, look, I did a thing. It's a real thing. It has value. And I, in my whole education, uh, have really come to not value or devalue things that you can't see. And so, um, one of the, and tied to that, so she keeps telling me, no, 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 math, do it for the sake of math. And I'm coming around to that, come, do it for the sake of understanding, do it for the sake of seeing, like, what's really there. Um, but the other piece to that is that, um, no, see, I didn't bring notes. Hang on. The other piece to that. I didn't tell you what you were going to say next. Do it. Okay. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, there's that. Um. Oh, is that not the next part? Okay, never mind. I can so, tag so. out, tag out. <laughs> um, so I'm going to follow up from there. Um, That's fine. So in your math education, you're not going to always produce something, unless you, know, you actually legitimately enjoy having an A on your test. You're not going to have physical things in the world that show that you understood something or that you achieved something. You're going to start having successes where like, you spent forever being wrong, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh no, wait, oh, we get it now. And everything clicks into place, and that, that becomes your blinky lights. That's what you have to start to appreciate, which is hard, and it took me a long time to get there, but eventually understanding has to become your success. You have to be able to enjoy finding the phenomenons and all the like beautiful intricacies of mathematics, which is why I really think you do have to study it for its own sake, for what? Not forever. You, you should eventually apply it. But you do need to study it for its own sake because if you're not going to learn to appreciate the intricacies and learn to value that you understand that, then what you're going to have is the continued expected failure, just continually getting the wrong answer. But it'll also be the hammer again, where you're just hitting a nail. And you might create things. You can create a lot of things just by hammering nails into stuff. A lot of it is actually very useful. But when you do fail, you won't, un you won't be able to figure out why unless you have that underlying structure. Um, and I have far too much anecdotal evidence about that. Tag team. OK. All right. So following right on off of that, um, the mathematicians are doing, and this is following on the tool metaphor, um, I hadn't really understood it like this until fairly recently, but it helps me to think of the mathematicians as building me my tools uh, to help me be a better engineer. And um, one of the other things I've been doing a lot recently, and I'll just recommend it, if you haven't read um, Dr. Hamming's uh, You and Your Research, um, he gave a speech, I think, in like 1986. Uh, it's a YouTube video that's really good, but it's also been transcribed, and it's totally worth looking up, You and Your Research. And he talks a lot about um, 
the things he's observed in his life about doing significant work. And one of the things he says early on that I had never thought of it like this, he just says, you just give your permi yourself permission to do significant work in your life. And I thought, oh, oh I've, never, I've never given myself that permission or to even think about that on that level, about my work as having an impact. And if I just do what I've been spoon fed and I've just keep to techniques that I've learned and I apply them and I'm pretty good at pattern matching, I'm pretty good at saying all oh, these techniques work this way and I, I, I'm a pretty decent engineer, then that's something and I probably have a good career and that's all right. But there's this other part where um, I get excited when I am engaging with like, why is that tool? Why does that tool work? What is really underneath that? And, I, and as I think about it more, it's a slow process and it has fits and starts, but I start to see like there's a really beautiful, like I start to see the beauty in the systems and I start to see like, see the world in a way that I hadn't before. And as I get more into it, I start to see there are people who've spent their whole lives not making blinky lights, but doing the thinking and they found value in it. And it, and it by engaging with what they've done, I'm able to look at what I'm doing in a slightly different way, maybe find a different way to do it, maybe just have a different approach, maybe just have a different attitude towards it. But it, it gives it context, it gives it, um, it gives me more options than just taking like, oh yes, we learned this class, so I'm going to do this technique until I'm 55, and now, I don't know what you do when you're 55, but. Um. <laughs> no, but. <laughs> No, but, but um, you know, and, that, and the other piece to that is the world moves and the world changes and there are new tools coming all the time. And if you just take them when they're given to you, how, and you don't have an idea of what's going on behind the scenes, then how can you know that the tool you've just been handed, the language you're using, the approach you're using, how do you have any way to know or to gauge like how good that is? I mean, anything can have a really great marketing face on it and be the coolest new thing. But how do you know that that's the tool that you wanted uh, for the thing that you're doing. And this is called optimization. What's, I guess I'm optimizing my, I'm optimizing my process of optimizing my tools and my choices. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and the other piece to this is as I'm engaging and I'm seeing, I'm reading, I go to Powell's occasionally and, uh, you know, I end up in the technical bookstore and I, I come home with the book and I'm read it and I'm, I'm surprised and I'm delighted and I get that feeling and it does, uh, like she said, it, it, it is, there are valuable moments that are as valuable as having a, a made thing that blinks. Um, but the other piece to it is I really realized, um, I took a couple Coursera courses and I don't generally finish them. And part of it is because um, I was socialized in, over my course of education into this grading thing. And the grades just destroy my, um, like my openness, how when you first go on the first week of class, you're like, this is great, I'm gonna think, I'm gonna engage, I'm gonna be different this time. And, <laughs> and, and then I get my assignment back, and in my head, it stops being about engaging, and it starts being about number crunching, and about getting that A, and about value, and all this, and I, I'm afraid to make a wrong answer. And so the thing I'm realizing is that Coursera and the MOOCs and all this, they, they seemed really like, oh, this is wonderful, but for me, they don't work. If anything, I take their curriculum, the, the, uh, the summary, and I just go off and spend money somewhere and, or read on the internet. And in that way, it becomes something that exists outside of somebody else's system. And it's entirely for me as a person and, and in my work and in my engineering life to engage with it and go forward and it becomes valuable and, and delightful. And, and it just becomes free of other systems. And so that's something I recommend. If you're, if you're here I and, you're, and you're an engineer and you're scared of engaging, then I think that might be something useful is to give yourself permission to not understand what's going on for a long time and to be aware that your successes may not look like you expect them to be and you may not, they may not be immediately applicable in your, in your life, but math, and I got yelled at this for saying this, but um, math, Philosophers, math, math was a part of philosophy. Technically, everything was part of philosophy once, but yes, but math separated much later. <laughs> so, if you think of it like that, what you're actually thinking of when you're don't take an engineering brain into math. Take a thinking, like a, a thinking and engaging in a, in a not building, 
but uh, what is this? What could I do? Is this going to work? They're called scientists. <laughs> I'm agreeing with you. Take a, sci <laughs> <laughs> Take a science brain into, into math, for sure. So. Anyway, um, so I know that sounds like I'm saying just keep going on and educating yourself, but as you continue to just learn more about these structures, they'll come in handy at sort of weird random times when you didn't even realize that like, it's because you had a strong background on mathematics. So this happened to me a little while ago when someone tried to teach me regex. And I realized pretty quickly, or they said finite automata, and I really quickly realized like, oh, I already know how to do all of this. Actually, I'm a lot better at this than you. Um, <laughs> and, that will tend, and then after that point, regex was really, really easy. Um, and, then, and that just started because I took a game theory course a really long time ago, and we had a finite automata where we, yeah, you were in that class. Um, <laughs> uh, and you just, we had these little finite automata where we you know, theoretically had them play games against each other, and you just saw what two deterministic machines, I don't know what word you want to use here. I, just call them structures, uh, compete against each other and you see what deterministically has to happen from the end of that. And that's how regex spontaneously made sense when somebody's just trying to say like, oh, this piece does this, and this piece does this, and this piece does this. And at the end I realized like, oh, gotcha. These are just things that say this arrow goes that way and this arrow goes that way. And it tells you that at the end it has to be a yes or no and it will always be the exact same thing. So I had this person that just knew the word finite automata. They said regex was one. And I really quickly, well, regex isn't one, actually. This is kind of annoying. But regular expressions are finite automata. And I realized really quickly that I already knew how to do all of this. I just had to learn the new words and symbols that were in regex. All right. Um, do you have anything else you want to add? I think I'm good. All right, cool. So the last thing we have is just some resources or some things that can help you sort of think about math and your education. Um, a Mathematician's Lament is a really great paper that takes some more, some much better metaphors about what math education looks like versus what mathematics looks like um, and shows where all the failings are. Um, what it feels like to be bad at math is the story of someone that got all the way up until the last term of their bachelor's in mathematics before they finally struggled in a math class and what that feels like and really sort of shows a that even the really good people eventually hit a wall and they get stuck somewhere just sometimes they sprint a little farther but it's kind of like quap like some people just luck out for the first like couple <laughs> feet um, <laughs> um, so yeah that's what that one's about um, by heart is a youtuber who I love so, so much. I think her enthusiasm for math is infectious. I love her. Um, Number File is another really great channel. It sort of focuses on like weird little phenomena. It's not structured very much. They'll just take a number and be like, here's a weird fact you didn't know about this number, which sounds dumb. And I hated it until I found Graham's number. If any of you know what that is, it's insane. Um, Khan Academy will help you hit the nails with your hammer, but I think also does a pretty good job of telling you like, this is why we chose a hammer. And then if you want to, if you're learning a new language, like a computer language, and you don't really want to have to go through the tutorials that say, this is what a variable is, this is how you print hello world, I recommend trying Project Euler because you use all of those tools to do sort of tedious math problems, but it, what this does is it forces you to really think about what is the underlying structure of the things you're trying to find. Um, so this is more of the here, build a chair, go find your own hammers kind of <laughs> approach to math education. You should be warned that as of a few days ago, Project Oil was in some I other heard other about other that. The problems are still up and we're looking at it. And there are. Um, it used to be, that's right, they lost their... If you were on Project Euler and you didn't know this, because I didn't get an email, uh, they had a, pa a security breach, and their passwords and names, I think, I don't know if they actually lost them or not, but if you should change your password, if you were, you know. Um, but they... Setting all that aside, it's a great resource. It is a great resource, <laughs> and in, there are, um, you can look and uh, try the problems first, but there are people who have put the solutions out there as well, so... Uh, you can't check in with the site anymore to tell you if you got it right, but there are people who have put the answers out on like GitHub, so they're out there if you want to look. 
Alrighty. That's all. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to write that down. Oh. What? So what's it called? Struck by genius. Struck by genius. Okay. Cool. Interesting. I was totally with you until you said in programming, and then I realized all the ones I've used, all the ones I've used, I specifically avoided putting in here because I didn't think I would have enough time to explain them. Uh, but if you ever have the opportunity, I would really strongly suggest reading or taking a course. I don't know if Coursera has one. Um, any class on group theory, uh, which is a subset of abstract algebra, it's. It's one of those classes that if you can understand that, a lot of problems that you thought had complicated answers spontaneously become very, very easy. Uh, I, what's an easy way? I, I guess I would say it's the study of symmetries. But um, that's definitely something you should look into. It's a great, well, for starters, it'll make Haskell make a lot more sense if you have a background in abstract algebra. Um, OK, more anecdotal evidence. Uh, I wrote a program once that if you picked an arbitrary polygon and you told it to rotate it and flip it over, and you just told it to do that over and over and over again, it would tell you what the fastest way to get to the orientation that you picked was. Uh, and I showed this to a friend, and I explained the algorithm. And he's, he works in DevOps. Um, I mean DevOps, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it should be DevOps. <laughs> it's exactly what it sounds like. Um, anyway. He works in DevOps and is really good at his job. And I showed this to him. And he was like, I feel like you're really brute forcing that. That doesn't seem like a very efficient way to go about doing that. There has to be a better, better way to do it. And I spent two hours showing him just the basics of how group theory works. And at the end, he looked at it and was like, oh, no, you're right. That is the fastest way to do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's really rewarding. Um, but it's one of those, it, group theory especially is one of the ones where you just sort of have to study the structure for a really long time. And all of a sudden, like some problems that look kind of hard, you just happen to know a cheat for them. Yeah. <laughs> because then you've got the cheat code, so to speak, for the analytics solution. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Even with. No, I'm not going to try to explain that, actually. <laughs> I'll do it wrong. Uh, yeah, you'll definitely know a lot of closed form solutions, but more importantly, you'll know where to find them. Like, you'll know what words to Google. If things just sort of look familiar, you'll start to see problems that look like problems you've already encountered. And you might not be able to figure it out immediately, but you'll already know where to look for the answers. Well, and if, you know, if you're designing algorithms, which should be the aspiration of every programmer in the world, <laughs> is, you know, you can't design it out. The more insight you have into how things actually work, right, the better your algorithms are going to be. I mean, the easier they're going to come by. You know, if I'm thinking about how you rotate and reflect things, and I need an algorithm that does some of that, then having group theory in my pocket is really, really important. If I'm thinking about you know, how combinations of things would fit together to do something, then linear algebra may be a really good tool to have in my pocket so that I can think about it in a more coherent way. Oh my so gosh, it, yes, linear algebra. Yeah, yeah, Study yeah. linear algebra. <laughs> Yeah. Even in mathematics, linear algebra has this amazing way of like, so there's this problem and nobody knows how to do it, but if we can find a way to encode the information in an array, then the answer is already there. Like, it just falls out. Linear algebra is wonderful. And, and actually, <laughs> so a piece on that, I've tried linear algebra so many times, and it, it just it sucked and sucked and sucked, and it just was terrible. And then I had a book on quaternions, and I was trying to figure out quadcopter rotation. And like, suddenly, suddenly, I was like, oh, this, is, this is completely makes sense because it's my application, and I've got it. So. 
bringing it in as a project, and even though that's the opposite of like just learning things you have in the back pocket, when you get something like that, it's a great application. That can sometimes be the trick to get you through, and now I'm all right at it. So. And also, I was going to say, knowing an application can sort of just help you visualize things better, yes. so it doesn't really take away from your knowledge of quaternions that you happen to get to it through an application. Well, I, I think there's this weird skill trip thing that happens. You know, you know, this view of the world people have that somehow, you know, you have one of these RPG style skill trees where, you know, you need to have somebody good at some, this skill and somebody at some, that skill, and then you're at, then this task will be. That's not, that's not how it works, right? Each one of these kinds of mathematics really is, more than anything else, a way of thinking about the world, right? And guess what? The more ways you have of thinking about the world, when you're trying to solve a problem or just understand how something is, it's going to be, right? the, better, the better you're going to do with it. Uh, what a surprise. And so, you know, there's almost no kind of mathematics I can think of, except maybe category theory. <laughs> I don't think that's technically mathematics. I think it's actually like a level above. Because yeah, yeah, yeah. mathematics is, I think where, it technically is only set theory in the. Right. Where, Sorry, this doesn't make any <laughs> sense. Don't ignore, <laughs> ignore this conversation. Category theory is actually kind of fun. Yep, we're good. We're good. I, I would encourage you guys to continue this conversation. Um, possibly over the tea break that um, right now. Cool. Or